My name is Kathy Jordan. I am the Director of Art Development for Willett Hauser Architectural Glass. I have a very unique relationship with this church. Uh, just, I would say, nearly 28 years ago, um, there was an educational opportunity that happened in, within this church to restore the stained glass windows. It's always a, a, an issue and something that churches have in front of them to take care of and be stewards of these beautiful turn of the century windows. And 30 years prior, you know, money being um, a challenge for many churches, uh, we had a workshop that was offered. Um, Arthur Feminella gathered together studios. It was put into the periodical at the Stained Glass Association of America that there was going to be a workshop to restore the Lafarge window. Uh, my studio, the Art of Glass in Media, Pennsylvania, we attended the workshop. And we removed the entire window and we started to restore the petals of the rose window and found that it had roofing tar and mastic uh, all over the exterior of the petals. Um, it was so pervasive that the time frame that was allotted for the restoration in the workshop, we ran out of time. So they boxed the middle portion of the window and it sat for 28 years in a closet. And lo and behold, my life as a conservator came back to this church with Art Feminella and we restored the Tiffany window behind me. Um, so I continued to have a relationship with the church, really not knowing what the fate of the Lafarge window was. And my studio grew and I continued to do conservation work and I made a decision in 2014 to join Willett Hauser as their director of art and my studio closed and I moved on and this project came back into my life and I just felt like you couldn't make this up, <laughs> that I would come down. I can remember the day they called and said, well, Kathy, it's, it's in Philadelphia, it's a church, you know, it's close to you. It's the, the First Unitarian Church and it's a Lafarge window. And it was like this old young person inside of me was like, wait, this can't be happening. And so I found out that it, it for 28 years we came down. Probably the highlight of my career was being able to do the conservation work on the face of Isaiah and to work in the same capacity in this project that young conservators and apprentice could work and learn the way I did. But this time I was at the helm to make this happen. So I have a PowerPoint presentation here that's going to be hopefully not too technical. Uh, it's going to show you some of the actual work that we did at the studio. And I'm much better with a paintbrush than I am technology, so bear with me. So truly, this was the only photograph that we had um, that showed a monochromatic view of what this window looked like before it had a century of dirt and um, paint loss and, and problems. So it became invaluable, especially for me when I did the conservation work on the face. But the church looked at this opening for nearly 30 years like this. You know, right on the face of uh, Chestnut. And I came back down um, and took a look. We opened up the box to see how the window had fared for nearly three decades. And I have to say that if this window had stayed in that opening, in the condition it was, there would not be a face left on that window. So... The irony of that was it was the proper thing to do to take the window out of the dangerous environment it was in and it was cared for. There was no damage from the actual um, storage, but it was in pretty bad shape. So again, Michael had talked about the history. I won't go into that because it, he's a tough act to follow, so I don't know that I would be able to 
to, to engage you that way about this history of Lafarge and, and Tiffany, but we, you know the premise of where this, this design came from, which w happened a lot in um, stained glass windows. There were copies of, of famous paintings so these are some quick pictures I'll go through. It's uh, a before and after shot. We take pictures to document in reflected and transmitted light. You have the beauty of seeing this window most often in reflected light. I'm sorry, in transmitted light. In the evenings, you would look at it and be able to see uh, the color palette up there in um, transmitted, reflected light rather. Uh, here is another before and after. Again, from the exterior. So we document uh, interior and exterior of this window. And what's interesting about both um, rose windows here is there's a plating process. That's what the, te the technical term for it is. Uh, most of the windows in this church are a single layer of glass with every piece of glass painted with vitreous paints and then fired in the kiln. But what happens as the light goes down is the window goes dark, very much like the window here this, that is uh, no longer lit properly, but it, it reads dark. And what happens with the Tiffany window and the Lafarge window, as the light goes down, the opalescent glass still remains viable. Um, so in order to get color, and depth, they would both plate windows. There are multiple layers. There is a homogeneous base layer, and there are pieces of glass that um, protrude into the interior, and there's also pieces of glass that were attached to the exterior. And this window was five layers thick. If you took the interior and added layers to the back or layers coming forward. So it made the... Um, the actual matrix and structure of the window very complicated to build or to disassemble, um, and it became heavy, and there were areas of weak um, continuous lines where there was some distress in the upper half of this window where along the arm of Isaiah, um, it wanted to begin to fold on itself. So when the window came into the studio, we did the... Um, um, archival rubbings. They were rubbed from the interior and the exterior, and as uh, plates came apart, uh, we did more rubbings. This shows you the area of the elbow, and we were able to maintain the original lead in the elbow area because it was, we, we checked every square inch of this window to see what was stable and what needed to be addressed, and for the sake of the historic um, lead came in the matrix, which is very, very apparent in Lafarge and Tiffany windows. It's as much uh, an important element as the glasses, as how they assembled their windows. There is some original lead work in this window. These particular uh, uh, identify the different lead cames. I believe they had seven different profiles that were identified in this window. Um, so that's, this marks the rubbing where those different leads would appear. We salvaged and kept a lot of the lead came as the window came apart, and this was uh, a way to help us reassemble the window, and it was, it was important. This is the disassembly process, uh, working and cleaning, um, and that went on quite a bit, and uh, continual photography, um, to understand how this window came apart and that it went back together in the same area. So what we did discover was there was serious metal fatigue in the window and metal fatigue in lead came. You would see uh, in, the, in the run of a piece of lead that the, the windows, the lead would actually start to separate. And not only do we see that on the exterior level, as we remove the plating, and you see in the lower um, right-hand side, that fatigue was also in layers that were underneath. So the window was starting to buckle and separate, and the lead came was, was so fatigued it was giving way. So the dirt and the mastic, like I discussed before, um, 
was quite pervasive and a lot of time was spent on the cleaning process to bring this glass back. Uh, if you can see that, that literally is almost a quarter of an inch thick dirt between two layers of glass. When you see that, it's interesting because I'm a, a glass painter. Um, if you even put a skim of color in a matte surface that's like on all of this, that'll start to arrest the light. These layers of paint on all of these windows modulate the light that's transmitted through. And, if you, and then when you take opalescent glass that has a density itself, um, and then you put a quarter of an inch thick dirt in between it, it's almost would be dark. You'll never see the combination of colors that was so beautiful in a Lafarge or a Tiffany window. It wasn't so much when the light goes down, you see the surface color, but when the light comes up and it shines through the window, you see what happens when you put a piece of blue and green and all these successive colors together. So that was um, extraordinary, the amount of dirt. So half the window in this picture is not cleaned and the other half is. So it gives a, a, a pretty dramatic um, illustration of how much dirt was on these windows. Um, also, we probably took this picture more for us um, because there's a mistake. <laughs> and it does my heart good that they made mistakes back then too with these wonderful windows. But this right here is when the window, the tie wires were connected to this window that would secure it to a, a, um, a horizontal bar, the heat of that solder dripped down in between the layers and everything. And you want to avoid that when you work, but uh, if Lafarge did it, that's okay. Um, so what was interesting too about plating, you'll see the blue piece of glass when that was removed, there was a, a really um, complicated lead matrix of four or five colors behind it. So you look up at the, some of those windows and you see one massive piece of glass, but in the morning you'll see the knee or, or the arm where all of these colors come through. Uh, a very big difference between Lafarge and Tiffany windows um, was Tiffany created a glass that was called drapery glass. And you see it in the angel above me where the fabric was modulated within the glass itself. And what Lafarge did was, is every fold and every value shift in color was its own piece of glass. So the leading, the lead logic of his windows could be far more complicated. It was insane. <laughs> That's what he thinks. It's just incredible. And both of them would defy the odds of what glass was supposed to do with the way they cut the edges. Um, it was amazing. So this is a piece that you wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend anyone do when you cut a piece of glass. Again, it also illustrates before and after cleaning. But if you can see this, there were no diamond band saws. There was no, it was someone taking a glass cutter and a, a set of grosing pliers and chiseling it and biting and nibbling it away to have that kind of a reveal. And not only did they do it once, they did it multiple times because it was a plate underneath it. So they repeated it. And then the fact that that window, because if a window torques just a tiny bit, this is a, this is a weak point. That's where it would want to break and it didn't break. So it's, it's just a masterpiece of a, of a glass cutting there, the glazers. Again, there were a lot of pieces in this window that needed to have um, intervention with repairs, whether we did the repairs with through leads, uh, we used an epoxy glue, silicone, it all depended on where the break was in the window, where it was in the layers within the window, and what kind of break it was. So there was a lot of different conservation techniques used in gluing. Uh, here, Cassie is uh, working on the gluing aspect And when you get a window in a studio that's a plated window, you need a lot of real estate to lay this window out because as it comes apart, you need another table for the next layer. 
And as you clean it, you need another table. So this is just one half of the window that started to take up the real estate within the studio. And these are pictures of the window being uh, reglazed as it went back together. Lots of documentation, lots of photographs, custom LEDs and whatnot, and the, that painstaking patience of Cassie to put this back together. Many, many, many hours. And you can see here what's interesting about this picture is there was a clear layer um, of glass to the flesh. The little angel and Isaiah's face uh, were not on, it was, that was a base layer, was uh, some of this clear glass. So she's soldering this window back together and that's a progressive uh, where these flat windows, you'd assemble the entire window and then you would solder as you know at the end this one you you actually had to solder it as during the process and it stabilized and kept this window together as you move forward um, so the big challenge uh, with this window was obviously the flesh and when you look at the window you look to the faces and figures of all the windows I mean that's the first thing you go and you see and it was uh, just an extraordinary amount of paint loss, severe paint loss. Um, I'm going to go, uh, the, I will be showing a little video that goes into detail about this, so I won't talk too much about it in the slide. I'll let the video speak for it. But this gives you an idea, and believe it or not, this picture uh, was after I cleaned it. <clears throat> So there were varying degrees. Isaiah's face seemed to be, uh, obviously, was the, the worst. Um, the hair in this little angel uh, was, was difficult, and it showed loss. But there was this tiny little angel uh, that's recessed back, almost peeking through underneath the arm of the other angel, who held all of the answers for me, because there was a piece of glass to the interior that protected that glass. The feet were four layers thick. There was two layers that were um, heavily painted. And on the very fourth, uh, the most interior layer is blue. And it's, the blue was put there to make this foot seem like it was recessed underneath and behind the bench he sat on. Another challenge for me was the, the, the piece of glass was warped. And the warpage most likely happened in the firing process. The glass gets heated up to 1,250 degrees. And oftentimes, opalescent glass wants to strike or taint change color. I can imagine that was a challenge for the studios because it still challenges us today, um, this annealing process and how much heat the glass will take before it wants to break or it wants to warp. So I, I, I started very, very conservatively with the cleaning. I took a soft brush and just wanted to see what would come off with just a, a very light feather dusting type of cleaning. Very conservative when I went in. And I was able to uh, bring along uh, Cassie and teach her conservation painting, which made my heart sing because she's such a passionate um, glass artist. I spent a month, the better part of a month, working on the project up there and working with Cassie. And that's a before, and that's the after of the conservation painting. So when the window goes back together, it gets puttied with a, a linseed oil, calcium carbonate whiting mixture, and we protected the conserved painting that we had done on the flesh because that whole process is cold. It, it, it could not go back into the kiln. So I had to use with consolidants um, 
that can serve the paint that was currently there after I cleaned it and the, the cold painting was done on top of the consolidation layer and then it was consolidated again to protect that painting. So we had to protect the, um, the faces. So there's some, you can probably see it from the exterior if you look. It's difficult because of where the porch is. Now there's protective covering on top of it. We added some structural fins to the back side of this to add and augment the structure. And it followed many areas. It follows the lead line and the lead logic. So it doesn't cast any kind of shadows or interrupt the way that the, it looks. But you have um, horizontal um, bars on the interior and some of these fins went vertically so that kind of matrix helped and that was where there was a real trouble area with this the upper half of the window. Um, so these are some final pictures I believe of the before and after from the interior and exterior after the faces had been conserved. All the flesh cleaned and this is Cassie Kruger who ran this entire project. Uh, I hope that she and I have the opportunity to talk about this project. I am the sitting president of the American Glass Guild, and we will be in Corning Museum of Glass in 2022, which also happens to be the International Year of Glass. The United Nations has uh, passed a resolution on May 18th that says that glass will be celebrated internationally and we are, I'm also right now um, the co-chair of the North America's steering committee for the International Year of Glass. So I think, and I've talked to Luana and some others with the effort and how deeply attached I am to this church and in the essence of education, which our, the American Glass Build is a non-profit charitable entity uh, that focuses on education, that perhaps we bring young conservators back to this church and to look and address some of the other windows, if anything, at least let the, the community, let Philadelphia know, the East Coast know, and those that follow Lafarge and his windows, that this church exists with extraordinary artwork uh, in every single window that's in here that deserves attention and I know that the foundation has been put in place, um, and I will assist in any way that I can to continue to stay attached to this church. So I have a video. I'm not, I'm not sure where David is. David? So... A, a, a little humor about this. He said to me, oh, let's do a video, Kathy. My hair looks horrible, okay? I feel like I, I look like I'm a thousand years old. I'm like, I'm, I look like I'm as old as Isaiah, but I, and I went off the cuff. It was, it was one take, so bear with it. Are you ready? We're here uh, this afternoon talking about um, some paint conservation for a Lafarge window. Um, at the First Unitarian Church in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It's a rose window. Um, the prophet Isaiah, it's based on um, Michelangelo's painting. Um, I was able to obtain from the clients uh, an actual photograph. There's not a lot of photography or information about this particular window, but they did provide us with a photograph that was probably taken in the 20s or 30s and it has been an extraordinary resource for me. It's a value study and it's the closest I'll have to what the window did look like um, decades into its installation. So when it came to the studio, uh, the window's completely disassembled and from the flesh, which has really suffered, um, especially the main figure of Isaiah, uh, it needed to have some uh, conservation painting work done to it. Um, if you pan over here, there was a photograph um, I had in the computer so that we could document this window to show you the type of paint loss that happened. Uh, there was also a surface quality to this paint area that was very, very chalky. 
and as condensation and airborne dirt, soot, candle, soot, whatever was happening over a century um, attached itself to this glass. And it also, as the condensation dripped, you can see trail marks of water. It could have been cleaning. At some point, the window, they attempted to clean it on the inside. Um, but there's clearly um, some attack. And what I had to look at here, what was really fortunate for this project, there were several um, pieces in this window that actually were plated. And plating is, is multi-layers. Uh, this particular foot, uh, the feet, uh, this was on the back side of the glass, and it literally had a fourth layer of clear glass behind it. The painted opal, all of the glass is painted on white opalescent. This is actually clear. Um, it marries up. To this piece when they're viewed and then on the interior side of this window it actually had a piece of blue opal from behind it so it's very difficult on this light table to see this but you can imagine the density and how much light would have to come through For the the um, object of this is to recess his feet back behind they're underneath a bench so that's a way to give you um, some sort of depth with this with plating. And that was a technique that Lafarge and Tiffany both did. They plated windows to give some sort of depth. But as a painter, um, this was an extraordinary find for me because I can see the looseness in the painterly um, style. I can see the brush marks. I could actually see the paint pigment color. Um, there's a lot of Vister Brown in here and there's some raw lumbers. Uh, there might even be a little bit of black, um, but it's an orangey warm brown. Everything was warm. So I, I, I learned a lot about studying how this was done. And then we also had another um, piece that was very helpful for me. Um, it happened to be this tiny little angel, also plated in front of it. Let me just remove this tape. Um, to make, to recess him back behind. So we had three faces, Isaiah, we had the little little uh, cherub that sat on uh, his shoulder and then another. So when I remove that, you see this face and then we had a clear piece in the back. So this little head, um, what was interesting about this head was uh, he didn't have the surface dirt. He didn't have that condensation. He didn't have that attack because he was protected. He was painted on the same base glass as Isaiah was painted and the feet and the other arms and other pieces of flesh. So he became a resource for me to um, look at the color. And there was a little bit of a flesh tone in the cheeks here and a tiny bit, which you'll see, you know, in Isaiah, there's some really warm tones. Um, it's difficult to see this because it's on a, we're, we're on a light table here. Um, so I'm gonna remove the plate from behind him just so he shows up a little more. And then just to make this interesting, um, this particular head was severely warped, uh, and I would imagine that it most likely happened in the kiln. Um, I, I don't know if they would have picked a piece of glass like this that had it warped to start. Um, so to take extra care with this head, because um, I can even get my fingers underneath here. Um, so I studied this head and the painting, and. Most of that work for me were the hours that I put into actually cleaning the window. We clean the windows with cotton buds, um, deionized water, um, and I actually used uh, a mechanical scalpel on areas very carefully in and around um, where the darkest dark would meet the lightest light. Uh, that's a transitional tone that was lost uh, it actually was abrupt. The paint loss created this abrupt loss between the highlight and the darkest dark. So I had to remove the dirt um, to find, you know, what truly was the shadow area. Because with soot and grime on it, it was reading black. And there's no real black area in his painting in any of the ones that were protected. It was very, it was a deep, deep brown. 
So I was able to get down into the really darkest dark areas. I could see his brush stroke marks. So in cleaning, um, I, I studied the painting. As I removed the dirt, I actually removed the dirt the way I would have removed it if it were a mat that was laid across the top of a glass. I, I cleaned this window as though I was painting this window. I'm a glass painter, so I understand light source and um, the process that you would get to adding value and then what you have to do to remove it. So I studied the way this was painted the entire time I was cleaning and that time became invaluable when I went to actually start to bring back the lost areas. I wanted to bring back the areas in very much the same manner that a glass painter would have applied vitreous pigment. Um, and I was able to do that once all of it was cleaned. And it was the transitional areas here that were so abruptly lost, especially in this area. So all of my brushstroke marks were congruent with what, how it was painted originally. Um, we consolidated the piece after it was cleaned. Um, and this helped protect any of the original paint before we would put the reversible cold paint, which is oil paints on top. Um, and I applied them in a way that it was, it was a series of, of glazes. So we, we consolidated the paint that was drying, uh, completely dried. So the cold paint is over top of the consolidant at this point. Um, this window is now drying. Uh, I feel that I've brought back as much that's needed. There's a place where you just have to stop um, and make sure that you're, you know, it's the aesthetic of this. Anything that was visually jarring, I believe that I corrected. Um, it was a privilege to be able to work so closely with such an, a historic piece and to look at all of the different um, painting styles of uh, Lafarge's windows. We will now consolidate this once it's completely dry one more time, and that will protect the cold paint. Uh, in this particular installation, the window does receive uh, protective covering to the exterior, and like I said, these heads also sit within um, plating to protect it from the back from any kind of really um, severe temperature or hum humidity shifts. So I think what we've done is um, been very sensitive to this uh, painting and uh, we've brought back the beauty in this window uh, and we continue to do the rest of the restoration um, on the remainder of the window. Thank you very much.